I don't know what my intro is going to be yet, so hi, my name is Sarah, if you're new here, if you're not, welcome back. Today we're getting into another Meet the Sims speed build. We will be talking about Gideon and Betty P. Davenport and the just crazy, crazy things that that woman has gotten up to in my little Simiverse. So I'm going to try to keep this very concise and very coherent. And if I fail to do that, I'm sure Editing Sarah will let you know. <coughs> so, without further ado, I'm going to stop squawking and hand it over to VoiceOver Sarah. So thank you for tuning in, and I hope you enjoy. Everyone please meet Gideon and Betty P. Davenport, Ellie Davenport's grandparents. We will start with Gideon. Gideon Magnus Davenport is the only son of Gladys Hayworth and Claude Davenport. Gladys and Claude never married, a big no-no back then, because they just never got around to it. Neither was big into the idea and thought if they truly loved each other, they didn't need to be married to prove that. They also got a kick out of making the townspeople squirm and would smile at each other when they got dirty looks on the streets. They had a daughter three years after Gideon was born named Charlotte. Claude was the black sheep of the Davenport line and had been cut off by a majority of the family well before they had moved to Willow Creek. The Davenports were what's royalty way, way back in the family tree, so the family as a whole had a lot of pride in their name. The past royals were not very good at their jobs though and were overthrown by their constituents and had to flee to what is now known as Henford on Bagley. Gladys and Claude's refusal to marry is what started the rift within the Davenport family tree. The aunts and uncles and grandparents thought that Gladys was too open-minded and this behavior was rubbing off on Claude and ruining the family. Gladys never wanted to marry even as a young girl. Her parents were happy, sure, but they fought an awful lot and she never wanted that for herself. She never wanted to fight or scream at the person she loved and she thought that marriage was the trigger for all the arguments and was just fine staying a Hayworth. Claude admired this about her. He had met many women in his youth who were more interested in the fact that he was a Davenport than that he was an actual human with thoughts and feelings. The two of them had decided that Charlotte's last name would be Hayworth Davenport and this was the nail in the coffin. The Davenports were willing to let it slide when Gideon was born out of wedlock because he was a Davenport, but with the birth of Charlotte out of wedlock, and that she is a Hayworth Davenport was way too far away from the family morals. Once word got back to the higher members of the Davenport line, a letter came in the mail for Claude. It was from Sissy, his mother's oldest sister and the acting matriarch of the family after the sudden passing of Claude's grandmother. Sissy was clear and to the point. If Claude and Gladys, whom was referred to in the letter as mother of your youngest child, did not wish to be Davenports, then they were no longer considered members of the family. Claude's yearly family allowance that had already been reduced was cut off completely. This also meant that the home that they had been leasing from Sissy's husband was no longer available to them. Claude and Gladys were given two days to pack their entire lives up and find somewhere else to live with a newborn. Word had spread fast through the small town and many local businesses also barred Claude and Gladys out of fear. Two young parents had no other choice but to get out. Gladys and Claude decided to move out of Treaton, the small town that they had all lived in, and relocated a few hundred miles away in a new housing development being built called Willow Creek. The Willow Creek we are all familiar with today is a drastic difference to the massive field that the Hayward worth Davenport's had arrived to. The terrain was excellent for development, but few Sims had the kind of cash it would require to purchase a plot of land to settle there. But with a small donation from the general store Claude worked at in Treaton and the kindness of Gladys's parents, their small family had just enough to afford the smallest lot available at the time, located at the top of a hill overlooking the lower section of the development. Claude and Gladys worked for many years to build a stone cottage for their family. With only two bedrooms and a combined kitchen, dining, living area, it wasn't much, but it was theirs. Gideon grew up with an excellent example of how hard work, dedication, and some sacrifice you could achieve whatever you set your mind to. From a young age, Gideon knew he wanted to be his own boss and wanted to own his own business. Gladys was an avid gardener and taught Gideon all she knew and let him help her with the yearly sowing and harvest. Gideon treasured this time he got to spend with his mother and it was these times that he longed for a family of his own one day. Gideon was a very dedicated student and excelled academically. 
He was able to skip several grades in middle and high school and graduated by the time he was 14 years old. He wanted to attend college, but financially, he and his family just couldn't afford it. They all lived comfortably, with Gideon and his younger sister Charlotte never needing for anything, but college was an expense that was just too much. So Gideon worked with his parents for a few years between the garden, vegetable fields with his mom, and working in the lumber yard with his father. On his long walk to work at the lumber yard with Claude one morning, Gideon stopped to help a young woman with her bicycle tire that had come off. They weren't able to repair it there on the side of the road, so she walked with him to the yard where the foreman would be able to inflate the tire back up for her. This walk seemed a lot shorter to Gideon on this day, and maybe it was the beautiful fall morning, or... Maybe it was because he didn't want the walk to end. The closer they got to the yard, he felt his heart beating a little bit faster with every step. When they arrived, the foreman swiftly filled her tire and she was about to leave. He wheeled the bike for her to the end of the dirt driveway and their hands brushed together in the transfer. Gideon felt a flutter in his stomach that he had never had before. She blushed and turned her head away as she began to mount the bike to leave. Gideon jogged around and stood in front of her so she couldn't placed his hands over hers on the handlebars. He leaned in, kissed her cheek, and released her hands. She sat completely still with a small smile on her face. Name's Gideon, he said with a big and bright smile. She laughed lightly and said, thank you for your help. I'm forever grateful. My name is Abigail, and extended her hand to shake his, which Gideon took and kissed before stepping out of the way so she could get by and go on her way. Abigail pushed forward and made her way back to town, and Gideon's co-workers had all formed a group to watch the entire encounter take place. As he walked back up the driveway, they all hooted and whooped, swinging their hats in the air, with a few workers reenacting the scene. Gideon just smiled and shook his head, waving them all off as he made his way to his post for the day. After this day, Abigail and Gideon spent most of their time together when they were not at work. Abigail worked at the local seamstress's office, and she was a very talented sewer, with many of her designs were sold in the little shop's front window display. Gideon would walk by on his lunch breaks and give Abigail a thumbs up on the designs. Sometimes they were mild reactions, and other times he would turn on the theatrics to make her laugh. Gideon's dream of working for himself began to creep back into his mind. He wanted to secure his and Abigail's futures and the family that he wanted to have one day. After a long day at the lumber yard, Gideon was called into his boss's office. Gideon was worried that this had something to do with the little prank he had played on one of his work buddies that ended in a lot of white paint all over the warehouse floor. But to Gideon's surprise and relief, his boss had a proposition for him. His boss was nearing the end of his contract for the land that the lumber yard was located on and where the company was allowed to log. He wasn't planning on renewing the contract as he wanted to retire and spend more time with his own family. He offered Gideon first right to buy the contract. Gideon questioned why why him and not say his father, for example. His boss had offered it to Claude at first, in fact, but Claude turned it down and even proposed that he asked Gideon. Gideon accepted and immediately went down to Town Hall and purchased the contract. Gideon had been saving every penny that he had made for the last few months and barely managed to save the 1,000 simoleons the contract would cost. He then changed the name of the lumber yard to Davenport Lumber Co. and built his empire. He and Abigail had one son named Lucas, but were not able to have any more children due to complications during Abigail's pregnancy with Lucas. Abigail had always wanted a large family, so this hit her the hardest. The three of them lived happily together though for a few years until Abigail got sick. One winter she had walked home from work during a snowstorm. Gideon had insisted on having one of his workers pick her up but she didn't want to be a burden so she just decided to walk. She caught a cold and the cold never went away. She got worse and worse until she couldn't leave the house and she passed a year later to the day. Lucas was only seven at the time. Gideon had laid her to rest in the family cemetery located at the old family farm. Gladys and Claude had passed a couple years prior, and Gideon had purchased the surrounding lots of the old family cottage and built his home on that land where he also had a family cemetery constructed behind the old cottage. Gideon threw himself into his work and hired multiple nannies and tutors for Lucas. After Abigail's death, Gideon and Lucas's relationship basically ended. Gideon would go on to expand the lumber business to include a number of orchards and vineyards, which is where he met Betty Pumlob again. And now we move on to Betty Pumlob. Betty Pumlob grew up in Treaton with Gideon, but her family was much wealthier at the time. The Pumlobs owned the general store where Claude had worked in his early days in town and were the only store for miles. Betty never liked working at the store as a child and resented every minute she spent stocking the shelves. She never excelled academically, but did graduate high school and attended college in pursuit of an arts degree to the dismay of her parents. Growing up wealthy, Betty never felt that hard work was 
her thing. She saw the success of her parents' business as her personal wallet. She would sneak a few dollars from the register to hit the town with her friends or to buy the newest dress at the tailor shop. This had gotten her in trouble in the past and is most likely where her kleptomania stems from. After college, Betty moved back to Treton to live above the family store in a small loft where the excess stock was stored. Her parents allowed her to stay there for free, but she still found things about the place to be ungrateful about. Her constant nagging for better accommodations became too much for her parents, and they kicked her out within a year. Betty crashed on couches of acquaintances, but never stayed anywhere longer than the night due to her constant demands. Betty was actively trying to prove that beggars could, in fact, be choosers. After Betty had exhausted all of her options, she decided to get a job at the local winery. This was a mom and pop kind of place that Betty actually liked working at. The slow pace of leading the tours around the vineyard is the kind of thing she could get behind. The free wine was also a great bonus. Betty would work at the Ward Vineyard for a few years before she was brought into an employee meeting where she was told that the vineyard was being sold. She was crushed. She had put a lot of her time and effort into this place and she felt angry that they were thinking of selling. The meeting ended abruptly when Betty stormed out and ran into a man standing just outside the door. She glared up at him and said, I was walking here and waited for his apology in response. The man just chuckled and said, Gideon Davenport, I'm buying the vineyard. When his name hit her ears, Betty instantly recognized him. He was a far cry from the gangly boy he was back in school. Betty's glare melted into a sweet smile and she extended her hand. Gideon took it and she giggled like a little schoolgirl. Gideon remembers this interaction as being a little off-putting, but Betty, on the other hand, Thought she had him wrapped around her finger. I won't bore you with her courtship as it was short and honestly not very thrilling of a story. He basically bought her anything and everything that she wanted and she thought that that was what love was. He was just lonely and wanted someone to share what he had built with, which is kind of sad. Anyway, moving on. Gideon and Betty married, and she moved into the Davenport family estate in Willow Creek, which is what you see now. The old family cottage where Gideon grew up used to sit at the back of the property opposite the hedge garden. The cottage stood the test of time, and Gideon often had repair people out to keep up with the building. His plan was to eventually move out of the main mansion and back into the cottage in his elderly years because the upkeep of the mansion itself was just too much. He would will the mansion to his son, that way it stayed in the family. However, during construction of the new wing of the mansion, workers began tearing down the old cottage. Gideon had arrived home after almost the entire thing had been taken down, and he ran out to the workers, waving his arms wildly, trying to get them to stop. They told him Betty had authorized the teardown, as it would have been in the way for some of the heavier pieces of equipment. Gideon was shocked and just walked back into the mansion to confront Betty. He only got four words in before she started crying. This was her tactic, and unfortunately, it worked every time. Gideon would get rightfully upset. She he would cry, and then all would be forgiven. Betty even went as far as to blame the workers, who were promptly fired and a new crew had to come in to finish out the construction. Construction on the new wing finished and the decorating began, but only the finest pieces of furniture and most expensive textiles would do for Betty. But these things do come at a price, and the money allotted for this renovation was running out fast. Gideon finally put his foot down, and this sent Betty off. He was becoming less tolerable of her spending and was finally putting a stop to it. Betty needed some way of either getting him back on her side or making the money to finish her dream home herself. And then a call came in one day from her step-granddaughter requesting to purchase one of the older properties in Henford-on-Bagley. Once Ellie purchased the old orchard worker's cottage, it wasn't long until the money that Ellie had paid to Betty and Gideon ran out as well. Most of it going to expensive tile that looked gaudy, in Gideon's opinion, but he wasn't allowed to make any design decisions even though he was the one with taste. Betty just liked expensive stuff, and the remaining money had to finish paying out the work contract with the workers that Betty forced Gideon to fire. This is where the property tax lawsuit came into our story. Betty had been perusing online groups for people who needed advice regarding property disputes. After reading one article in which the author was completely in the wrong, Betty made up her mind. She was going after Ellie for more money from the property because of the success of Ellie and Maeve's vegetable and baked goods business. The way Betty framed it in the suit is that she had sold the property to Ellie and Maeve not knowing it was actually profitable, meaning because they had put in the work on the land to make it viable for growing and were making money, 
Betty was due damages for being misled about the true value of the property. She didn't want a lump sum payout either, and she said in a sworn statement that she had to drastically change her lifestyle due to the loss of income relating to the property, which again is a massive lie. If anything, she has drastically improved her lifestyle since the transfer of the property. This was a messy lawsuit with lots of personal insults being posted to social media, by Betty of course, which made the whole ordeal even more difficult for all parties involved. Prior to filing the lawsuit, Betty had manipulated Gideon into believing that Ellie was trying to overthrow the family business. She had concocted a wackadoodle story about how she had overheard a conversation at the last Davenport wedding between Ellie and her brother John about how easy it would be to just sign over the titles without Gideon's knowledge. Gideon was a bit apprehensive to the lawsuit at first, but after Betty filled his head with all of these lies, he signed his name to the lawsuit without another question. Now, if you didn't watch the other speed build where we discussed Ellie and Maeve's story, this lawsuit was dismissed by the judge and Betty was ordered to pay attorney fees and some fines for wasting the court's time, but she was never actually charged for anything. She was, however, served with a no contact and restraining order from Ellie and Maeve. Ellie had tried to repair her relationship with Gideon, but Betty had poisoned the waters. He hated Ellie and her brothers for what Betty had told him they did. At this point, Betty knew she could tell Gideon anything and he would believe her. This was the plan all along for Betty. She just wanted to get as much money out of this as she could. The final step in her master plan went off without a hitch and with very little effort on her part. At breakfast a few weeks following the ruling by the judge and after all fines had been paid, Betty brought up Gideon's will. What a shame that they will still profit off of you after you leave this earth. What a true shame it is, Gideon, Betty began. It wasn't long before Gideon was on the phone with his lawyer and had changed the will to leave everything he had to Betty. Betty was still sitting at the dining room table, tapping the corners of her mouth with her napkin. She picked up her coffee cup and an evil smile slowly spread across her face. She finally had everything she wanted. Okay, I think that's all I have to say about these two. <laughs> I also did not furnish uh, this house fully, complete with all the decorations and kind of clutter, cluttery, cluttery? Yeah, cluttery items I wanted to because I, uh, I wanted this lot to actually load. So the inside is a little sparse, but it's, you know, it kind of would be if they were renovating still. Yeah, let's go with that. Yeah. So thank you for making it this far into the video, and uh, if you liked it, I don't know, maybe hit that like button. You could even subscribe while you're down there. Uh, subscribes are free. Isn't that awesome? You just gotta click the button. That's cool. Uh, we are getting to a really cool part of this build, and I'm going to come real time for you guys real quick. Because there's something really cool that I wanted to show you. It's over here. So if you look right here, you look really closely, you'll see the house tour. Mm -hmm. 